take your seats and we'll soon begin. Well, that was effective. Welcome to the University Aula. And before you can begin your evening, I just need to give you a few safety instructions. In case of an emergency, there are three main exits. You have the two in the back of the room, which you entered from, and then you have one emergency exit on your far left. Now, if an alarm does go off, we all have to leave calmly because we are in a museum. So there's no running. And although you can exit the aula from many exits, there is one place which is very important. We all have to meet up at the statue of Christi. And if you don't know what Wilhelm Koren Christi looked like, just look for the statue with the lion and you'll be good. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, they're all. On behalf of the University of Bergen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, EADI Nordic Conference, to the University and our University Ola. My name uh, is Dagrun Olsen, and I'm the rector at the University here in Bergen. And of course, we are proud to co-host this year's EIDA Conference. The program as least, at the least as I can judge it, is impressive, and the focus of this and the, the focus this conference has on pressing global and development uh, questions and issues is of great importance also for us as a university, from a, a scholarly perspective. That is, it um, fits also quite well, I'd say, with um, core activities at our university what we aim to be, so to speak. Research on uh, de uh, developmental questions has always been important for us, and in our strategy that I think we, uh, well, a couple of years ago, since we decided upon this new strategy, global challenges is one of our prioritized areas. It consists of health, poverty, migration as the three pillars. And of course, it rests on activities and skills that we have developed over years in these, within these fields. We believe that these issues and how we meet them are more important than ever. How do we address them? How do we dig into these questions from a scholarly perspective? But also how do we, how we de um, educate our students to address perhaps one of the most pressing uh, questions uh, of uh, on our globe and, and uh, our time. Challenges in health, environment, democracy, equality, and fair development of our societies require extensive cooperation across disciplines and across different parts of the world. That is why it's so important that we gather. That is why it's so important that we share ideas and also challenge each other from various perspectives from various disciplines and also various parts of this globe. An area where um, collaboration is essential and which has an important place at this conference is to work on UN's sustainable, sustainability goals, the SDGs. And the University of Bergen has taken a national responsibility, I'd say, on um, this important topic or regarding this important topic by taking initiative to a common national platform where we discuss the relevance of universities, universities, the educational sector, the research activities to the SDGs. As an um, international oriented university, the University of Bergen is especially committed to cooperation with developing countries and have established programs with universities around the, the world in uh, these areas, that is health, poverty, resource management, to management to, to mention um, the most important ones perhaps for us. The city of Bergen is uh, also a hub for development related research and higher education with a long history of engagement. Here, Armauer Hansen discovered the uh, bacterium causing leprosy 
in 1873. Where, and this is also the city where Frederick Barth made his path breaking work into anthropology, and where Stein Rockan worked on his world-famous studies of political processes. Wilhelm Bjerknes, one of the founders of the modern weather forecasting, is also important to mention in this respect, as climate change will be an underlying challenge for all human activities in the years to come. Institutions like Christian Mikkelsen Institute and Norwegian School of Economics have a long history and, um, in addressing development questions. And today many research milieus and uh, groups directly address some of the most pressing global challenges we are, are facing. The Bjerknes Center, Center for International Health, and also the Institute of Marine Research, too, to mention a few of them. I hope that uh, the discussions and the sessions on this conference at this conference will be um, useful for your further and future work. I hope it will inspire and I hope it will lead to new collaboration to strengthen the work on understanding, addressing and solving global challenges. Soon, it, um, it's my pleasure to, to pass on the word and also the floor to Isa Bo, the professor, professor of International Development Studies at the University of Amsterdam and the president of the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes. But first, some music. Christina Jönsson and uh, Alexei Labusov, both students at the Grieg Academy here at the uh, Faculty for Art, Music and Design, will play for us two pieces by obviously Edward Grigg, from The Mountain Maid, The Kidlings Dance, and, and At the Brook. With this, I wish you good luck with the conference, and welcome again to the University of Bergen and Bergen, and please give a big hand and warm applause to the mus musicians as they enter the aula. Thank you.
Vice-Chancellor Olson, Rector Olson, I like that uh, Latin term better, actually. Iyadi colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, let me extend a very warm welcome to you all here in Bergen at the Iyadi Nordic Conference. As Iyadi, we are very grateful to the Norwegian Association of Development Research, who is co-hosting this conference with us and have found it a great pleasure to work together in the past 18 months. I do believe this conference, and I go back with Eyadi relations um, back to 1980. Forget that immediately. I have found, I believe this conference is the one with the smoothest organization I have ever seen in the history of Eyadi. Especially let me thank Erlen Eitzvig, Tord Roe, for their close cooperation with our Iyadi team, headed by Jürgen Wiemann, 
Yari Vice President, Susanna von Eter, our Executive Director, and the full teams behind both of them. We have become good friends in the process, and I look forward to future cooperation. Our hosts are, as you can see from your program, the University of Bergen and the Christian Michelson Institute. The University of Bergen, as the rector has just mentioned, has indicated, is very internationally oriented, and your current strategy focused on sea, life, and society recognizes global challenges as a priority area. The Christian Michelson Institute has a long-standing focus on development research, and indeed one is one of the few institutes in Norway which focuses primarily on research in the global south and has been a long-standing member of EADI. The work of both institutes resonates with the current theme of our conference on globalization at the crossroads, rethinking inequalities and boundaries. And I would like to thank both Vice Chancellor Olsen, Tora Sutterdal of UIB Global, and Director Otto Mastad, am I saying that right, of the CMI for your commitment to the goals of IADI and the conference. When we started our discussions on the theme for this conference in the management and in the executive committee of EADI, several political processes were making waves across Europe and indeed globally. The USA election process and its candidates, the wars within the Middle East and North and West Africa, the international stream of people migrating for political and economic reasons, and the European countries' reactions. But equally, the agreement on the SDGs which was reached and the Paris Agreement on dealing with climate change. The way these processes were being framed in the political arenas of Europe and the US made us realize how important it is to keep the perspectives of countries in the global south in the international arena, both to counterbalance the political rhetoric, which does not reflect actual trends in the world, and also to bring forward forcefully the advantages of an increasing global interdependence and polycentric world. This was the reason for us to raise the question of globalization again for a reassessment. To what extent is it a set of exclusionary and monopolistic processes, or is it possible to shift globalization processes to, towards more inclusionary processes? by developing and renewing social contracts which recognize the rights of people in the world everywhere. Therefore, we decided to start off this conference by inviting our keynote speaker for the Dudley Sears lecture to reflect on an essential global infrastructure which strongly influences or determines the potential for exclusionary or inclusionary economic development the issue of financial power and inequality. Our speaker for this afternoon is James K. Galbraith, who holds the Lloyd and Benson Junior Chair in Government and Business Relations at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, and also holds a professorship in government at the University of Texas in Austin. He chaired the board of the Economist for Peace and security from 1996 to 2016, and currently directs the University of Texas Inequality Project. He was also executive director of the Joint Economic Committee of the United States Congress in the early 1980s. In the mid-1990s, he served as chief technical advisor to China's State Planning Commission for Macroeconomic Reform, and in the first half of 2015, he served as an informal advisor to the Greek Minister of Finance. In 2016, he advised the presidential campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders. In short, an academic with an extensive engagement with society, which is very much at the heart of what we, our perspective in EADI. I'm sure you are looking forward as much as I am to hearing him speak. The floor is yours, James. Director Olson, Professor Baud, my friends, 
It's truly a great pleasure uh, to be here, uh, to be asked to uh, address this conference and to give a lecture uh, in the name of Dudley Sears. I got a little insight into the importance of Dudley Sears just uh, five days ago. Uh, I was in Montreal uh, for a small ceremony honoring the life work of a truly distinguished political economist, Kari Polanyi, uh, and Kari spoke of Dudley Sears as one of her friends and influences. Uh, so I asked her afterwards to give me uh, some more of her perceptions, and I gathered, without going into too much detail here, uh, that uh, the, if Dudley Sears were here today, he might uh, be sympathetic to some of the arguments that I uh, plan to present. So from that point of view, it's an especial uh, privilege and honor uh, to be asked to give this lecture. The theme of this conference, Rethinking Inequalities and Boundaries, also is something uh, to, with which I feel a very strong affinity. I began to work on the problem of economic inequality uh, over 20 years ago now, uh, reflecting my unfailing instinct for the unfashionable uh, and the low prestige activity uh, in uh, the field of economics. Uh, it has since developed a considerably more interest than it was generating back then. Uh, at that time, uh, just as the, the uh, perception that inequalities were rising in a dramatic and disturbing way, initially uh, a perception I think was uh, seen clearly in the United States by the middle 1980s, uh, and elsewhere in the world was an obvious fact long before it was officially measured, uh, was treated by the economics profession largely within a framework of fixed intellectual and geographic boundaries. A, a debate that emerged in the middle 1990s on this topic was between two points of view, both of which were confined to a framework largely of supply and demand uh, in labor markets. On one side, the proposition advanced by um, uh, John Bound and George Johnson in the early 1990s, uh, and taken up since by many mainstream economists, that rising inequality was a matter of the interaction of technology and skill, a, relate, a race, as has later been said, between technology and education, uh, and on the other side, an argument that was advanced uh, substantially and most prominently by my old Cambridge tutor, Adrian Wood, uh, which held uh, that the issue was substantially related to the globalization and the increase of international trade, uh, and essentially the effective supply of unskilled labor uh, reflected both from emigration and from the globalization of production networks. And in the middle 1990s, those two uh, ideas were essentially, uh, if you like, battling it out uh, in the pages of the journals and, and books. I was asked to uh, look into this uh, debate, to write a monograph on it, uh, and it became clear to me in the course of thinking about how to do that, uh, that it was quite impossible to make a significant additional contribution without first expanding and improving and developing the underlying base of information. And from that uh, insight uh, and the uh, presence as fortuitously of a new group of uh, very talented PhD students, uh, we formed what became the University of Texas Inequality Project. Uh, and uh, devoted ourselves over now two decades uh, to the uh, exercise of attempting to develop a large-scale, consistent, 
dense, reasonably accurate, uh, and therefore useful body of information on the movement of inequality in the world economy as a whole. I can uh, therefore start by offering you uh, a credo uh, from the uh, uh, philosopher Charles Saunders Peirce, uh, born and raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just a few blocks from where I was born and raised, who wrote in 1877 that Kepler undertook to draw a curve through the places of Mars and his greatest service to science was in impressing on men's minds that this was the thing to be done if they wished to improve astronomy, that they were not to content themselves with inquiring whether one system of epicycles was better than another, but that they were to sit down to the figures and find out what the curve in truth was. In a sense, a very mundane uh, and very modest uh, aspiration, but one that I will argue has significant implications for how one should think uh, and rethink the problem of inequalities and also the problem of boundaries. Because having restricted the focus of the theoretical effort to specific predefined and pre-categorized markets, labor markets in particular, the economics profession as it approached this problem put itself in the position of overlooking the significant possibility that they had got the frame of reference wrong and that the frame of reference might be on either a larger or a smaller scale. And in particular, that there might be influences and forces at work here which transcend national boundaries, in particular so-called labor markets, uh, but that operate at the continental or even the global scale. In order to approach that question, we needed to have a, oh, let me uh, give you a sense first to take you back to that period in the 1990s of the kind of information that became available on the movement and levels of inequality in the world uh, through the very diligent work of two staffers at the World Bank, Klaus Deininger and Lynn Squire, who produced a remarkable data set, uh, their so-called high quality data set, from which I've taken here a number of plots. And you can see, uh, at a glance, in a sense, the problem of finding either trends in the data, or in the case of even so well-organized a country as Denmark, uh, figuring out which of the various genie points one should use for even a given year uh, for a given uh, analytical or comparative purpose. And the other issue, obviously illustrated by Austria or Bolivia or other places, uh, is that there were so many large gaps in the data that even if you had reasonably accurate observations, knowing what was going on in between the years when uh, surveys had been taken uh, was a deeply problematic uh, question. And uh, other, uh, Some other uh, examples of the same uh, information set just confirm the impression that the data that one had to work with, and I don't fault it at all, I think in many cases this was very good data for what it was, certainly what it was what is available, was not adequate to the task of providing a basis uh, for a sustained and effective comparative analysis. So what could you do? The insight which has underpinned our work uh, for the last several decades is that uh, it is possible to develop instruments uh, for uh, economic inequality, measures, in fact, of economic inequality, from data sources which are, in fact, readily available for m many, if not most, countries around the world, and which are even available for a broad swath of countries on a consistent basis as compiled by international organizations. The data, however, are categorical. They are data uh, for such things as total payroll and employment by industry or total income and population by geographic region. Uh, and so one has to be able to work with data that exist not at the individual level, that are not the product of surveys, uh, but that are administrative data collected routinely for other purposes, but from which one can calculate a measure of the inequality across whatever group structure happens to have been created. Uh, 
and record it. And the way to do that is with uh, the uh, uh, measure known as tiles, T-statistic, part of the family of generalized entropy measures of inequality, which has the lovely property that it can be arithmetically decomposed into a component within groups where R is the ratio of the individual income to the average group income, and a component between groups, uh, which is the, uh, based upon the population weight of a group and the group average income relative to the uh, income of the whole population times the log of the same thing. Uh, that is a very, very simple statistic to compute. It can be taught to any graduate student in 10 or 15 minutes. I always used to say, except for a Russian, with well, a Russian it only takes five minutes. Uh, but the, it's based on personal experience. Uh, it's beyond simple, it just requires uh, a spreadsheet and lots of coffee and uh, the raw material of data tables which can be collected from all kinds of sources. Uh, and from, on that basis, we have been working to build up information about uh, the movement of inequality across uh, regions and countries of the world uh, for, uh, well, as I said, for the last several decades. The data computed in this way has the nice virtue that it can be presented graphically in such a manner as to be decomposed by sector or by region, and here, I've done something which is available only by this technique using uh, the uh, nuts one regional data available from Eurostat's Regio database decomposed into six sectors to show the contribution of each sector uh, to the overall level of inequality across the entire continent of Europe without distinction by country. The, uh, the sectors that ha lie above the zero line are above average income and all the others are below average. This one, which is blue, is the financial sector. Uh, and you can see the effect of the crisis in reducing the level of, of inequality in the European continent by reducing, for a short period of time anyway, the income of the financial sector relative to what it had been at the peak of the boom. It's a very clear and simple and straightforward way of illustrating the movements of relative income across this very gross sectoral classification and over time. Uh, it also gives you a sense uh, right there from the beginning with respect to the European continent of the importance of finance, of financial sector incomes in the overall movement of measured inequality uh, as measured across the total spectrum of European payrolls. Uh, the same thing can be done by uh, regions, this is uh, uh, the same sort of chart, only done across 254 European regions. And once again, you can see that uh, actually just two of them uh, bear a significant part of the, uh, of the load in explaining the story of the evolution of inequality in Europe. And the one that contributes the most is the city of London, uh, which is not a surprise given that it is one of the two major financial headquarters of the world. The city of Paris is also very significant. A much more important in terms of o the overall influence uh, on inequality in Europe than any of the other metropolitan areas or regions uh, that uh, are available in the data set. So it's something which again brings out in a graphically clear way uh, what is happening uh, as time passes uh, over a specific region. We started very early working on major developing countries, uh, and this is uh, data collected uh, from the uh, State Statistical Agency of the People's Republic of China, published initially, we got it on rice paper, but more recently, of course, it's been available on the web in their State Statistical Yearbook. The Chinese data are, of course, suspect, uh, but not for this purpose. And we feel quite strongly because, first of all, they were not collected for the purpose of measuring inequality. That's something we did. And secondly, our findings largely are now being confirmed by the slower moving but still effective process of collecting survey data. What we found was that there are two uh, sub-peaks, if you like, in the movement of inequality in China, which begins to rise very dramatically in the early 1990s peaks across regions in the early 2000s. This is the regional 
uh, between provinces measure, and that is because the initial uh, growth of incomes, which is concentrated in places like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangdong province, spreads out over a wider geographic distribution, Zhejiang, Tianjin, Fujian province, amongst others. And then there is a second peak in the inequality across sectors, which comes with the crisis in 2008. There's a growth of inequality due to rising relative incomes in banking, utilities, and so forth, and that peaks uh, transportation, that peaks in 2008. The overall effect, when you add them together, is that there is a peak in inequality in China in about the mid-2000s, something which very recently, we started publishing about this in 2007 or so, and in uh, three or four years later, uh, survey data begins to come out, which confirms that this is largely uh, an accurate picture. Uh, to show you another country of considerable interest, uh, oh, there's China geographically, you can see from 1987 to 1997, using a, a color scale, where re yellow and red represent the prosperous areas and the, uh, the blue areas are those that, that lag behind, you can see the dramatic increase in regional disparity uh, that occurs over a 10-year period. Uh, another country for which it is very interesting to look at this data and from which very good data are available over the transition is the Russian Federation. And this is another way of expressing the same data across something like 70 uh, regions of Russia, Oblast and Krai and so forth, Rayon, uh, with, uh, uh, with the data at the bottom being the individual sectors. And you can see that in 1990, before the, financial, uh, before the transition, finance was at the bottom of the Russian income scale. Agriculture was roughly in the middle, and the whole thing was extremely compressed compared to 2000. By 2000, agriculture has fallen to the bottom. Uh, finance has risen to the top. And a handful of regions, this is Moscow, and particularly finance in Moscow, construction uh, and energy production in places like Western Siberia are what is driving the extraordinary increase in inequality in the Russian Federation over the transition period. Um, okay. That's just by way of introducing you to the flexibility and I think power of this technique. Uh, what we sought out to do next was to find a data source which could be used to compare countries across the much, as much of the world as possible. And that data source existed and exists in the industrial statistics of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization uh, in Vienna, uh, which uh, has been systematically compiling this information for a long period of time. So we obtained it, and using the industrial categories, which admittedly are quite limited in their scope, they don't include agriculture, they don't include services, but nevertheless, we will show produce an inequality measure which acts as a reasonably good instrument, uh, not only for what it measures directly, inequalities of industrial pay, but also for inequalities of household income insofar as we can uh, determine, and I'll give you some evidence on that in a few minutes. What I'm going to do next is show you some maps. Uh, and the maps show not the levels, but the changes in inequality. Uh, over the entire surface of the globe at six-year intervals beginning in the early 1960s and going up to 2008. Uh, and this color scale is the same all the way through, uh, so try to make it easy to pick out what is going on in the data. Light to dark blue are decreases in inequality, yellow to orange to red are progressively larger increases in this measure of inequality. And so all one needs to do is to observe over the 1960s, there's a period of decreasing inequality, equalization that's going on. It begins to weaken in the late 60s. In the 1970s, there's a definite split, the 70 to 76, between oil producing countries. You can see the band across North Africa and Southwest Asia, and the consuming countries, India, the United States, other places. The energy crisis that continues in the late 70s, the energy crisis hits the, sorry, the debt crisis hits in the early 1980s and transforms the picture in a dramatic way, particularly in Latin America, in Africa, 
and in fact all over the world, you're now moving into a period of rising inequality practically everywhere. Uh, and what will happen next will probably not come as a great surprise because in 1990, this is 1983 to 89, in 1990 we had uh, the beginnings, so we had the transition in Eastern Europe and then shortly afterwards the transition in the Soviet Union and you can see the dramatic increases in inequality that occur in that part of the world over the course of the first half of the 1990s. So what I would suggest that we're observing here is something which is quite clear once one illustrates it in a reasonably uh, transparent and straightforward way, uh, which is that movements of inequality uh, insofar as we're looking at industrial pay are in fact movements that occur at the regional and continental or indeed at the global scale. And they occur in ways which are highly correlated across geographic regions. So it would not be reasonable to treat the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe as separate entities here. They're undergoing the same process for the same reason and they're both all experiencing rapidly rising inequality. Similarly, going back to the 80s, one has specific events that are related to a global phenomenon, namely the global debt crisis of the 1980s, which has its reflection in this, uh, these data which measure inequality across industrial payrolls. Uh, perhaps not surprising conceptually when you think about it, but definitely something which is a rethinking of the effective boundaries of economic change and also necessarily a rethinking of the causal factors that lie behind them. Uh, if one goes on into the late 1990s, the rise in inequality begins to soften a bit, and then in the 2000s, it actually reverses in substantial parts of the world. This is the last I've got, is 2003 to 2008. And you can see that for various reasons, good or bad, uh, the major period of rapidly rising inequality, at least in this data, appears to be over provisionally uh, at this time. So it is not the case that uh, inequality is always rising everywhere as a feature of capitalism. It may be the case that particular phases of policy and of transition uh, have effects that other phases do not. It may specifically be the case uh, that the period of enthusiasm for the Washington consensus, for the neoliberal policies, for privatization and deregulation as a response to crushing debt burdens, uh, produced across the whole globe rapid rises in inequality, which were not reversed in full, but at least stalled and to some extent reversed uh, by the period in the 2000s uh, when large parts of the world, in Latin America uh, and the, in, in Russia and in China, uh, which had never really adopted a neoliberal model, uh, reversed course and moved away uh, from that uh, domain and uh, direction of economic policy. So it may well be that what countries and uh, regions and institutions do uh, has an important effect, but also it may be uh, that credit conditions changed around the world and commodity prices changed around the world. And so the conditions for improving inequality were much better in the period from 2000 to 2008 than they were in the 20 years before that. All right. How does that data relate to the problem that many economists are uh, deeply concerned with, which is household income inequality? The answer that we offer to that um, is based upon a statistical relationship between our measures uh, and for purposes of convenience, the original Dininger and Squire World Bank data series, about 400 and some observations uh, exactly overlapping with respect to country and uh, time, uh, from which we're able to calculate that relationship uh, and then to go and estimate a data set for household income inequality uh, from our measures of inequality of industrial pay. Uh, I, I won't dwell on the regression analysis except to say that the uh, variable that's of interest here is the relationship of our measure of inequality to the uh, 
to the, to the, to the uh, World Bank's measures, and it's a very stable relationship, a uh, very stable positive relationship. Ours is more volatile than Gini coefficients, which are damped, but they move uh, in parallel. The other variable that's important is the degree of industrialization, which we measure as manufacturing employment to population. The more you have of that, the more equal you're likely to be. The rest of it is simply uh, dummy co uh, variables to adjust for the different types of data that are available on the basis of surveys, in particular, whether the data are based on income or on um, um, consumption, whether they're based on households or persons, whether they're gross or net of tax. Uh, overlapping observations about uh, 430. From this, we are able to compute an estimated data set of household income inequality with almost 4,000 observations. It will have 4,000 of the next update over the years now from 1963 to 2008, and we're working up to 2012 or so. But, the question, once you do that, are your measures any good? Do they correspond with what other people are measuring, what other people have measured? And here, I'm afraid I'm going to inflict upon you a long series of uh, rather messy charts. It will give you a sense for just how messy this literature is. Uh, one of my students, actually two of them, uh, Beatrice Halbach and Alexandra Malinowska, went into this literature uh, with uh, a kind of passionate intensity and simply copied every inequality number they could find for a whole series of countries classified them according, very carefully according to the type of measure, and then plotted them on line graphs so that we could see whether our estimates fit within the range uh, that the established literature had found. So let's just take the wealthy countries first. Here's one, here's Canada. And you can see there are basically three types of measures in the survey literature. The green are market income, which I don't like very much, but it's very high. It's the income that is excludes income from government sources, so pensions and so forth are not in, this, in that measure. The red is disposable income, that's after transfers and taxes, and the blue is gross income, which is after transfers but before taxes. Our estimate is the black measure, and it sits right where it should be, in the middle of the various estimates of gross income inequality. It also has essentially the same trend in the Canadian case as the gross income inequality measure. So, if that is the pattern over a whole series of countries, I'm going to offer it as evidence that our very simple model, which just is based on two coefficients, one of them being inequality of industrial pay, which is the active coefficient, does a very good job of capturing both the level and the movement of gross income inequality. And now we go through and show you the mess. This is Denmark. You can see Denmark's a very highly studied country, but there are lots of different measures, and they're not exactly the same. Uh, so one has market, gross, and net, and ours falls nicely in the middle of the gross. Similarly, France is a, very, is a country with very sloppy measures, but we're again in the middle. Uh, Germany is a country with excellent measures. I like them because ours lies exactly along the line of the gross income inequality survey. This is the uh, late and unlimited uh, Deutsche Demokratische Republic. You can see it. Inequality declined to the point where the country collapsed. Uh, Greece, sloppy measures, but our, again, our model seems to work pretty well. Italy, similarly, Japan, Netherlands, Spain, Sweden. I don't know why Sweden's measures are as sloppy as they are, but they are. Uh, at the, uh, at the United Kingdom, we seem to be exactly on track. For the U.S., slightly complicated picture because our measures fall, while they track up to the early 1990s, they fall below most of the other measures in the late 1990s. The reason for that is that income in the United States, measured income, which is extremely well measured, includes a very large share of capital asset income, which we're not capturing. And most countries' income measures simply don't have that in it either because people don't have the capital asset income or because it's not effectively recorded by tax authorities, which it is in the United States. These are the CBO's numbers. And you can see a peak for the boom of 2000, a peak for the boom, uh, the mortgage fraud debacle of 2007 and collapse afterwards. Um, okay. 
A second group of countries, very interesting, the so-called transition economies, uh, is one which um, are countries which were moving away from socialism, and they have a very different property. Here's the Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic, insofar as they don't have welfare states with large tax transfer mechanisms, so the gross and the net are very close together. Our measures, however, still are very close uh, to both, and that is true in Hungary, it's true for Poland, true for Russia, and you can see the chaos of the Russian transition. Uh, you can see, similarly, the chaos of the Ukrainian transition, essentially the same phenomenon in both countries, massive increases in inequality uh, over a brief period in the late 80s, early 90s. And then there are many developing countries, I only show a few of them, uh, and our measures are, again, pretty good for Argentina, pretty good for China. In India, it's an interesting case because there's only one actual data point available for India that attempts to capture something approaching gross income, and it's that one. It's the Luxembourg Income Studies data, uh, and it's very close to ours. The Indian official data are based on consumption, and they're much, much lower, uh, and the, India is not unique, but almost unique in relying on consumption-based inequality measures. Uh, it's obviously highly misleading to compare them to income measures. I was extremely pleased but when the Luxembourg income study came out with a, something that uh, tends to support our claim that India has a very unequal income distribution. And I have to tell you that I gave this talk and a fellow who was responsible for that number came up and told me how pleased he was to see mine uh, because he needed the support as much as I did. Uh, in Mexico, you have very messy numbers, all of which come from a single survey, the INEGI of the Mexican government, and are based, the differences are based entirely on the way different researchers draw on that survey. Ours tend to be, well, okay, close, maybe not too close, we're not. In, in countries, in some countries, we're, we're low. South Africa, for example, we're below the consensus measures. Uh, but I would argue that for most of the developing world, uh, we are uh, reasonably within the consensus measures of gross income inequality. And our measures have the advantage of being much longer and continuous in time series uh, and directly comparable from one to the other. So from a research standpoint, it's an extremely useful, I think, I, I would argue, useful exercise. If you look at the uh, average with, over all the countries, it's uh, a somewhat illuminating exercise. You can see a turning point here and a turning point here. This is the breakup of the Bretton Woods system, the commodities and uh, debt boom that followed through the 1980s, and then from 1980 to 2000, with, uh, you see basically rising inequality, which peaks uh, after 2000. The reason this comes down uh, in this period is that you're adding in low inequality countries from the, trend, from the formerly socialist world, so that brings down the average. But I could do a more sophisticated measure, but this is just to give you the idea that there are definitely global trends here. And when you look at the turning points, it appears that those trends are associated with the major movements of global finance. That is to say, with the way the world economy is governed, with the breakup of the Bretton Woods system, there was a period of strong instability which ended in a vast crisis, which went on for 20 years and went around the world from Latin America and Africa to Eastern and Central, Central and Eastern Europe and then finally to Asia in 1997. In 2000, again, a turning point, interest rates fell, commodity prices rose, and the conditions made it, of the world economy made it possible for governments that were so inclined, Brazil, for example, uh, to pursue policies once again that reduce poverty and inequality in their domestic spheres. All right. I want to give you an overview of the household income inequality numbers. These are now on a scale uh, that is simply the familiar Gini coefficient. Dark blue is the lowest numbers, uh, red is the highest, yellow, orange, red, a natural gradient. And you can see in the 1960s a world in which the advanced countries uh, had relatively large middle classes and relatively low inequality measures. Uh, and the uh, countries of the tropical and developing world uh, had the opposite, relatively small, if not non-existent, middle classes, and relatively high inequality measures. These are just decade by decade averages. So to give you a picture of the coverage of the data over time and what's happening to it, again, something which is 
visible, and you can see as this is going to the 1980s, and particularly into the 1990s, there we are, as the uh, Eastern world comes into the data set in a clear-cut way, that things are really changing, and in the 2000s, the world of the 2000s looks much more like the developing world of the 1960s, with only just uh, a few countries here, Sweden, Finland, uh, that uh, maybe one of the Baltics is in there, that uh, uh, Czech, Czech Republic, uh, that continue to have measured levels of household income inequality that were comparable to what most of the advanced world had in the 1960s. So the world really has become more unequal uh, over and particularly as a result of this vast period of rising inequality in the neoliberal era of the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, that's uh, the broadest picture I can draw for you. Uh, but I want to say now a word or two about causal mechanisms. Uh, because uh, showing the trends and showing the turning points, I think, carries some weight, uh, but uh, it is helpful to develop the argument uh, with a greater degree of intensity and detail. And yet another one of my students, a very talented Argentine named uh, Maria Delfino Rossi, uh, after a brief term as a director of the Argentine Central Bank under Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner at the age of 26, uh, came back to finish her master's degree and decided she would do something useful. And what she decided to do was to tabulate exchange rate movements and see if they matched up to our inequality measures. And I suggested a hypothesis for her uh, that would explain why this might be the case. And the hypothesis is very simple. If you look at the industrial pay scales, uh, if you look at the structure of industry, any country has two industries, those that export and those that don't. And it is a general rule that countries export their best products and their highest paid workers are in the export sector. So when there is a decline in the exchange rate, a depreciation, the exporters instantly have more income because the foreign income, the dollars or the euro that they're earning, go up in, 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 in local currency terms, whereas those who do not export are still being paid in the local currency, in the peso or in the renminbi. And that being the case, the inequality will rise. So one ought to expect that the exchange rate and the inequality measures are correlated. The question is, is that correlation something that is systematic and is it strong? So that's what Delfina did, and here's what she found. I'll just go through a series of countries in alphabetical order. A upward sloping line uh, is a, let's say, support of our hypothesis. So there's Bangladesh, there's Brazil, there's Cameroon, there's Canada, there's China, there's Czech Republic, there's Hungary, there's India, there's Ireland, there's Mexico, there's Peru, particularly the smaller developed, Romania, developing countries, this re relationship is just exceptionally strong. There's Singapore. Uh, there's the Netherlands. Okay, it's not so strong for the Netherlands, but that's a dollar exchange rate. Uh, and uh, there's Tunisia, and that's before the euro, of course, Turkey, uh, Uruguay. Okay, one exception, Italy. <laughs> I won't need to remind you what Richard Nixon said he thought about the lira. Uh, but in any event, uh, the uh, fact is, it's an overwhelmingly strong relationship. And not only is it strong, it, it captures a very large share of the variance in industrial pay. And I've already shown you that the variance in industrial pay is a very good predictor of the variance and even the level of household income inequality. So I want to suggest to you, since there's no possibility that the exchange rates are driven by inequality, that the causal arrow here clearly must run from the movement of the international finance, financial markets currency markets, to the structures of pay, particularly in vulnerable developing countries, and from there uh, to the structures of household income. It's obviously not the only thing that's going on, but it is a powerful enough force to suggest that it cannot be neglected in any serious discussion 
of what should be done to alleviate the rise of inequality around the world. And it also suggests very clearly that if you look at the picture in the last year or so, in which the currencies of the rich countries have been rising and that of the United States particularly, and the currencies of the developing world have been falling, that when we are in a position some years from now to update this data, we're going to find that the inequality has risen again dramatically. But I think it's obvious that it has. If you look at Latin America, it's confluence of economic and political events are driving inequality up and reversing the gains of the last 15 years. That's what's going on in the world. And what's going on in the world is a demonstration of the power of finance. And unless that power is controlled and regulated, it will come back again and again to undo the, uh, the work of progressive social movements, progressive governments, trade unions, uh, social development forces, uh, by making it harder and harder for poor people to keep up uh, with the wealthy. It's a very straightforward argument, I think, and one which the data uh, have lent a considerable, one to which the data have lent a considerable amount of support. Okay, I got one other thing. This is a digression. This is a digression because I've come here from the land of Trump and I'm sure you want to know <laughs> what's going on in the United States. Uh, and uh, this is a, a comment about the effect of inequality on American election outcomes. And then we did a calculation to take account of the fact that in the United States, presidential elections are decided state by state in the Electoral College. And so one has to ask the question, does the inequality or change of inequality in a state have an impact or is it related to how each state voted in the last election. The last election was characterized by a campaign of extraordinary anger that's often referred to as populist uh, and uh, often associated with rising inequality. So I think if I asked you whether you expect a state which had a very sharp rising, a rise in inequality to be more inclined to vote for the Democrat or for the Republican? I would guess, based upon the few times I've asked this question of other audiences, that most of you would say that the rising inequality would tend people, pe make people angry to vote for the Republican. And that's a very common sense response. I hope that's the one you had in mind. Uh, but as you will see, it's exactly wrong. This is a, a, a map of how the counties of the United States voted red, Republican, blue, Democratic. And what we did was to calculate the change of inequality from employment and earnings data in the United States on an annual basis by state, data which were not previously available because some of the states were too small for survey-based measures, and then associate that change from uh, 1990 to 2016, 2014, excuse me, with the election outcome. The blue diamonds are the Clinton states, the red circles are the Trump states. And the interesting fact is that the 14 states with the largest increases in inequality, every single one of those states was a Clinton state. Every single one. You look at the uh, labels here, there's New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, California, Maryland, Rhode Island, Nevada, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Illinois, Virginia, New Hampshire, uh, and Oregon. The Trump states down here with the lowest increases in inequality, West Virginia, Wyoming, Oklahoma, Utah, Nevada, Nevada, Idaho, Kentucky. And then there's a group in the middle which are contestable. And it's interesting that the states that Trump won, uh, that uh, decided the election, Pennsylvania, uh, and let's say Minnesota didn't win, but it was Ohio here, uh, were states where the rise of inequality was relatively less. And a state like Texas, which he won, was a state where inequality has actually been increasing and it moved toward the Democrats in this election. 
Um, what do we make of it? I would suggest that there is a relationship, but the relationship really reflects the structure of American politics. The Democratic Party is a coalition of the rich, liberal, urban professional and the immigrant and the minority, the African-American community, relatively poor. When those two communities are dominant in a state, that's a democratic state. When those two communities are weak in states which are largely rural or where the urban and work industrial population has been falling because of deindustrialization, that's Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, those states are drifting to the Republicans. So I think we have an index which is not only good uh, for analyzing financial power, but also has a certain amount of interest in analyzing the way in which political developments unfold. And I think it's true not only in the US, but you can analyze the Brexit vote and the French elections and other elections through the same general metrics. So I just hope that encourages you to think uh, that there is some prospect uh, for data-driven work in economics uh, and some prospect for help for using uh, that information to help us understand the dilemmas of the world around us. Thank you very much. I promised 45 minutes. I see I spoke for 46 minutes and 13 seconds. And I hope I've left time for questions if you have some. Galbraith. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? There are still some time, if you like. There's one gentleman in front okay. here. First there, and then second, Flector Olsen. Thanks, Jamie, for this great talk. Uh, we, we, you briefly touched upon the interest rate question you know, in our private conversation. So could you just sort of give us a little more sense of how this interest rate is is the, is the sort of mechanism by which finance begins to play the role? Well, I, I think one has several things going on. One is the extent to which, um, let's say, global financial, financial markets globalize, uh, and that is the openness, uh, which is particularly great amongst the smaller countries. It's the large countries, the China, the India, the Brazil, uh, that maintain capital controls. Uh, I have to say, my one contribution to the well-being of China during the time I was working for the State Planning Commission was to recruit Robert Eisner, a figure of considerably greater weight than myself, to talk them out of liberalizing the capital account uh, in 1995. Um, the, uh, so when, the inter when you have a situation in which the indebtedness in that system has uh, gone up and uh, the, the debts are such that they are tied to flexible interest rates, then when Paul Volcker raised the interest rate to 20%, the base rate in the United States, well, the wheels of the world froze. The banking system then went into reverse, and everybody either, either well, their economy crashed, and ultimately they defaulted. Uh, and that created a essentially dysfunctional environment that affected affected countries according to the strength of the, uh, and the ability of their institutions to resist. The developing world, Latin America and Africa, was vulnerable. And they had to adjust by crashing imports and, cr and deindustrializing. Uh, Central and Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were af strongly affected. Poland was in debt. The, Russia was in debt. Uh, but they, 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 their institutions lasted another five or ten years. And then the Asians... Uh, <laughs> were hit in the, in the late 1990s. So that uh, seems to me to be an integrated explanation in which the interest rate plays an important role, uh, but it's not the sole factor. It has to do with also with, with how much debt is affected by global interest rates and how much protection societies have from uh, that kind of influence. I, I strongly believe in the importance, therefore, of large countries maintaining capital control and of smaller countries forming unions, financial unions, to protect themselves and stabilize themselves so that they're not being governed according to the whim or the domestic policy purposes that may emanate from New York or London. Thank 
you for a, a very nice talk, and I shouldn't probably pose a question because I'm not an economist and I'm not don't a, rub a, it in. A, 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 <laughs> a political scientist. But you you made a you made it quite clear in your present, presentation that uh, the financial sector is of importance with respect to the um, inequality and how that drives. Uh, but it, to me, it seems also that there is a limitation to what the national regulations of the financial sector are able to, to combat yes. these. So, so what we, do we do then? Because national governments obviously only have the responsibility and the possibility of uh, national and local um, regulations, but that's not sufficient, is it? Uh, it's uh, definitely necessary. Uh, I mean, a, a national regulatory structure, international regulatory structure, needs to be in place. Well, my, my view of the matter is very simple. You, that, that countries can be run by governments or they can be run by banks. Uh, banks don't do a very good job over the long run because they're, they're not, they're, not rep they're representing their own interests, which is understandable. Uh, and so a deregulated banking se sector is like running a reactor without coolant. It will blow up in short period of time. Uh, and uh, the evidence for that is just, I mean, history is littered with that evidence. Uh, so, uh, but I think that given the degree of integration of the global economy, uh, that regulatory structure really does have to work at a higher level. Uh, it would be nice if it worked at the same level as the banking system itself, but that's hard to achieve because of the unwillingness of the major banking countries, the US and the UK, uh, to participate effectively, right? which they, they regard their banks as instruments of predatory control of the rest of the world. Uh, and so, th therefore, it really has to be done at the, at, at, at the regional level by very strong institutions of countries that, uh, that, that are, have, uh, where the political economy is more balanced. Uh, that would be, I guess, my response. And definitely, uh, there's no, I mean, anybody who's studied Hyman Mensky knows that there is no permanent solution to this problem. A period of financial stability breeds instability because anybody who has capital in a long period of low yields reaches for yield, goes out to take more risks, brings in debtors with a higher propensity of default. And sooner or later, the system is going to become destabilized. But the object of regulation is to keep it going uh, smoothly as long as possible. This is not unfamiliar. Anybody who has a car knows that you maintain your car, it doesn't run forever. You maintain your reactors, but you decommission them after a certain period of time. Failing to maintain the car or the reactor, on the other hand, is not wise policy. And the same is true uh, for a banking system. I think that actually that metaphor is, is, is really quite precise. And it's also the same for those of us who have to regulate our blood pressure. I mean, it's not going to succeed forever. But the point is to make it work for as long as possible. Thank you. Jürgen Wiemann, EAD. Thank you. Um, I'm Jürgen Wiemann, the Vice President of EAD. And uh, I thank you very much for uh, undermining uh, possibly simplistic thinking that uh, rising inequality is related to populism and, and the backlash against uh, globalization. Uh, I try to make uh, up my mind w w what, what you show us. Uh, possibly uh, the, the picture in the US and the mm. same in the UK is that those regions, London, or the West Coast and the East Coast in, in, in the US, are more globalized than the rest of uh, the US, uh, the flyover uh, states and, and the northern, northern England. Now, obviously, uh, those... Uh, regions that are open to globalization are more in favor of the Democrats or in favor of uh, uh, remaining in, inside the EU, whereas those regions delinked from globalization or relatively delinked from globalization and showing a higher degree of equality, according to your statistics, mm -hmm. are in favor of, of uh, of populism and, and Trump and, and, and Brexit. Um, I, I try to understand that. So 
should we neglect inequality, rising inequality, because do we have to accept it as, as a feature of globalization, even if we have some concern as uh, social scientists and socially concerned people, but uh, these regions seem to thrive and seem to vote for those, I mean, I, I, I think uh, okay. the majority yeah. here in this audience would prefer to vote for, for the Democrats, maybe for your side of the Democrats and not for, <laughs> <laughs> for Hillary Clinton. But is, is that the, the, the point? Uh, should well, we at I, least be more relaxed with inequality rising? I, I would argue uh, that if you go to Detroit or Milwaukee, uh, or Cleveland, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. I was the McGovern campaign coordinator in the 19th Congressional District, Youngstown, Ohio, in 1972. You're looking at the effects of globalization. That's the steel towns, that's the auto factories, that's the, uh, in, in Milwaukee, that's the machine tool shops. Right? And over 40 years, these industries which form the backbone of the American industrial working class and the Democratic Party, United Auto Workers, United Steel Workers, uh, the, the machinists, very powerful at one point, have been uh, wiped out. They are the principal uh, victims in the advanced countries of the globalization process. Uh, there are two aspects of this. One is that uh, they've simply been replaced by the Japanese, the Germans, the Koreans, uh, now the Chinese. Uh, and the other is that they've been undermined but not entirely replaced by the influx of uh, foreign direct investment so that the assembly plants which used to be in Detroit are now in southern Ohio and other places where they are operating considerably lower labor costs. So either way, this area has been experiencing globalization. The difference is that in the East Coast and the West Coast, you've got the sectors which have been winning. Finance on the East Coast, insurance, Connecticut, higher education, scientific research in Massachusetts, and technology on the West Coast. Aerospace in Washington, software in Washington, the Silicon Valley phenomenon. Right? That's where the very high incomes are. And that's where you get the urban centers where the dominant political force is high income professionals, as well as a large immigrant community, which has no, is much less prominent in the deindustrializing areas because they're not so attractive places to go. It's not where the income flows are from which you can live as an immigrant. So that's why I, what I see going on. The, the globalization is a comprehensive phenomenon, but you have two very different attitudes toward it depending upon whether you've benefited or you've lost. And the reality in the United States is that there is a disproportionate electoral valence and weighting on the rural uh, regions which are predominantly uh, losers. So they have in this, in this have predominantly relatively lost out. And so they have much more weight. California only has two senators. 21 states that don't have the population of California, and each of them have two senators. Right? They don't together have the population of California. The House of Representatives has been redistricted in such a way as to overweight the rural uh, and conservative districts, uh, because they put all of the minority voters into, into Democratic districts so that they don't spread out and influence the vote in other districts. Uh, electoral college, similarly, same reason as the Senate, is weighted toward the... So it tips the balance of power in favor of those who are playing on the anger, which is justified anger. And that, I think, is very... See, the same thing in France the eastern France, the National Front areas. Same thing in, 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 the, in the Midlands and the north, north of England, the Brexit areas. 
It represents a failure, a failure of policy to address the regional aspect. People can always leave. They do. They go to New York. They can live good lives there. They go to California. They come to Texas. But the people who are left behind are the people who still vote in those regions. And if you don't address that problem, you are going to end up with a political divide which gets larger and larger to the point where it becomes unbridgeable. And that, I think, is happening in the United States. Uh, it is happening, and the Democratic Party has not really addressed this problem, come to grips with it. Um, it's also obviously behind with what was the remarkable um, disaster of the Brexit vote. Where people voted for something whose implications they, did, they couldn't understand because it had never been explained. They were simply told by the high and mighty that this would be a, a terrible thing. And the high and mighty were unable to relate it to their interests or to respond to what those interests actually were. Thank you so much. We allow for the very last yeah. question, a very yeah. short one and with a short answer, yeah. and then we proceed. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I have two small questions. Also on the last slide, um, uh, if I understood you correctly, you uh, looked at the voting pattern compared to the change in inequality. Uh, yes. Did you also look at, uh, did you also compare with the absolute levels of inequality yes. and would the picture look different then? And my other question is, did this measure of inequality include the capital income or not? And the answer to both questions is yes. Uh, this is, um, we did do the levels. I, I use the change because it's, it, it, the, it's a little more dramatic. Uh, the, I, it, maybe it's the top 10 or 12 states at levels. Uh, but since the states were much more equal 25 years ago, the change and the levels are highly correlated. Um, the, um, and, and in terms of capital income, the, it's, not a, it's not a tax based income measure, so it doesn't capture realized capital gains. Nothing captures unrealized, no data captures unrealized capital gains. What it does capture is earnings by sector and state. Uh, and so you have a great deal of income in the US in the advanced sectors and the financial sectors, which is the result of stock options realizations or, uh, or, or the payout from venture capital right, in, the, in a startup firm. So, and that is registered and taxed, as, as, it's registered as payroll taxes income. We are capturing that. Uh, so it's, Going, what our measures are going to be very closely associated with the tax measure of capital gains. Uh, that includes capital gains. And actually, uh, an interesting uh, detail. Uh, we've done this analysis across counties in the U.S. There are 3,150 counties in the country. Uh, and if you look at the period from 1994 to 2000, the Internet information technology boom, if you remove five counties from the data, uh, then the rise in inequality that occurs in that period drops by half. Right. The five counties are, you guessed it, Manhattan, New York, New York, three counties in Northern California, Santa Clara, uh, San Francisco, and um, San Marino, I, did say, I think that's the third, uh, and um, uh, and King County, Washington, Microsoft. So that's where the, the stratospheric spheric incomes captured in very, very small part of the country. And much of the rest of the country didn't experience the dramatic rise of inequality. It really is a phenomenon. Rich people concentrate in very small places. That's where they report their capital gains and their, and their venture capital incomes. Professor James Galbraith. Thank you so much for giving us an excellent kickstart for this conference. Uh, you have provided us with, uh, with a backdrop that is useful for, for all of us, independent of, uh, of disciplines. I do um, want to call attention to the multinational character of my team. A Korean, a French, Polish, Argentine, Iranian, and Chinese. There we are. <laughs> Thank you.
My name is uh, Arla Nijtsvik. I'm the chair of the Norwegian Association for Development Research. And it is my privilege on behalf of all the organizers to express our gratitude and our appreciation for your excellent talk. We do that by local produce, <laughs> local products, and uh, a locally written book from the Raftu Foundation, but with a very international um, theme. So there you are. Thank you so much. Uh, tomorrow we will continue to explore dimensions of inequalities. We will start at 8.45 at the Cinema Hall, which is slightly easier to find than this venue. It is just across the street from the Scandic City Hotel, the conference uh, hotel. So be, be there before 8.45. We start sharp at 8.45. So now bridging uh, the Academia... With arts, we will have just a very, very short piece of, uh, of music. That's the cue for the musicians. If they are still here. Yes, there they are. Fantastic. And after that, we will, uh, we will proceed to the more mundane part, which is the uh, reception, which is downstairs, one floor down. Thank you all, and thank you to James Galbraith, and please, the musicians.